Hey, this is just a quick demonstration of the Podman machine on Windows capabilities I've been working on um, using WSL2 under the hood. Uh, so the typical workflow that you that um, this would enable is that a user would go to the Podman IO website. They would download the Podman Windows installer, which would then allow them to pull up a prompt and issue Podman commands. Um, and they would be they would execute a workflow very similar to what happens on Mac. Um, so I could say Podman machine init. Um, and this will use the default stream that's for whatever version is released. In my case, I want to use a more recent one. So I'm going to use the image path 35. So this works very similar to how Fedora Core OS would work, where you could specify to use the next stream instead of the testing stream. Um, and in this case, I'm using more recent we're using Fedora 35 instead of 34. Um, now this init process is going to take a little bit longer than it would on Mac because it needs to install all the container tools packages as well as updating the environment. Um, we could speed this up if we collaborate with the Fedora team and see if they could produce an image that has them pre-installed and that would skip this part. So while that's installing those packages, creating keys and generating the system configuration, I'll just do a quick overview of the WSL architecture uh, in case you're not familiar with it. Essentially, uh, it's based on the notion of having a lightweight VM. And uh, Windows, the Windows NT kernel itself runs on top of a hypervisor. And then additional VMs are created um, as an isolated virtual environment. And then the communication between the WSL um, Linux environment is actually running on a, a, a real Linux kernel. And it's using IPC between a Windows user space and a Linux user space. Um, to pull input and output across and simulate what it would look like if you were actually on a real Linux um, shell. So the way they achieve this is actually quite sophisticated. They have uh, essentially each Windows user gets a dedicated virtual machine, so they're isolated from each other. Um, but the but every user is allowed to install multiple distributions. So in this case, this example, there's Ubuntu and Debian. And then in the case this Pavia machine init is running, it's actually created a uh, distribution that is based off of Fedora um, that is being used to run the Podman to, uh, as the Podman guest. Now, the uh, they all share the same Linux kernel on the VM. And the way that's achieved is essentially ran in a similar environment as a privileged container. So that does mean they have the ability to interfere with each other technically. Um, so from a security model perspective, it's important to think of it as it's really the VM that is the security model. So all the distributions um, combined. And then within that environment, uh, they, as I mentioned, they have a custom init process. And the init process is responsible for tying the standard out, standard in to the underlying WSL uh, shell that's executing in the, um, in the Windows environment. And it also works in the reverse. Uh, if you invoke a, a, a exe file within the Linux uh, kernel environment, um, it actually redirects the executable to run within the, uh, on the local Windows host, and then pipes the output to and from. So it means you essentially have interoperability between Linux commands and Windows commands. And it works quite a bit better than the uh, SIGWIN environment does if you've ever um, used that. So um, as part of getting of using the WSL architecture, we also get um, file system support and networking essentially for free. The way file system support works is there is a 9P server running in both the Linux environment and in the Windows environment, and then there's clients on both ends. So within the distribution for Fedora that we're setting up, you can actually access the C drive by going to slash mount slash C, um, which means that we can easily support um, volume maps through the dash V command. We just need to add support for understanding how the paths map so that you can say you know, slash V, C colon backslash something, and that would then map over to the WSL environment. Um, and the networking just works out of the box. Now, as I mentioned, because they're sharing the same Linux kernel, you can have funky stuff happen. Like if one instance was to tear down the network interface, that would actually interfere with networking on the, on the other side. So it's really critical that all the work that is done within the WSL distribution is fairly isolated and does not try to do system stuff like mess with mounts or mess with uh, networking or anything like that. Um, so there is some special configuration to disable some services as part of this installation, but it's not a lot. Um, so once this completes, essentially it'll be the same experience as you had on Mac. Um, you simply would, uh, it'll say uh, after it finishes installing, it'll tell me I can, I can do a Podman machine start and that will um, under the hood start the WSL instance. 
And Windows is kind of nice in this regard in that it will actually keep the VM around, so it'll recycle it. So the, the actual start time is not very bad. So I can do podman machine start, and that is going to internally launch systemd in the WSL process. Um, and it has to do it in a special way where it creates a, a nested process namespace um, because there's already a Windows special in it. And uh, that's going to launch SSH, which is then used uh, by the Podman remote client, which is effectively what this Podman EXE is, just as it was before. So now, I, now that I've got this working, I can now say uh, Podman info, for example, and I can get the, um, the information. You can see it's a running instance running, uh, what version are we? 341. OK, so now let's go ahead and execute a container. We'll do a Podman run. We'll say a UBI 8 um, micro and date. So this is uh, going to, again, connect to the WSL instance over SSH. Uh, it's going to communicate on the socket. And just like it does on Mac, it's going to then do a pull uh, to download UBI 8 and run uh, finally run the date command. Uh, now just ignore this warning message on the top. Um, that's just a bogus uh, noise that's generated from the container configuration module. I need to look into that and fix it, but um, it's not, it doesn't indicate an actual problem. Um, now internally, this also was set up to use Slurp for networking. So that means we can also do networking. So let's show a demonstration of that. Instead of uh, running UBI macro, I will do, let's see, um, HTTPD. And we can bind port, we'll bind port 80 across the container. And you turn off this. Uh, and while, so when that's downloading, then I'll just go ahead and show that it's actually operating um, in the browser. So this is using a, because you know, I bound port 80 to 80, I'm using a rootful instance. I actually have rootless um, setup, but again, because the security model, the security model is around the Windows user, there's really not. Uh, an advantage to using rootless containers other than, you know, essentially simulating or emulating it. So I could see a user wanting to do that if they wanted to try stuff out. But I think for, uh, you know, common Windows users that are doing like Windows development and they want to use their Windows tools and like Windows IDE, um, it's probably the way that we, however we can maximize compatibility is probably the best approach. Uh, so now I can just go to um, my prompt here and we'll do localhost. And there you can see it works. And if I, if I refresh, there'll be um, uh, multiple requests that come through on the container side. OK, so um, now I can go. I can either go directly into the container instance itself, um, or I could do podman um, machine SSH. Um, so we'll do, the, um, we'll do the SSH approach that's similar um, to how it would work on Mac. And here I can do system. Um, control status, and I can see I've got a, a running system, all processes are up. And it, the, the environment is configured to be minimized to just the, the, the processes needed for, for Podman. Now, if I want to jump straight into uh, WSL, which I shouldn't, I, I wouldn't normally want to do that, or I think many users wouldn't want to do it, but if, I, but if for whatever reason I did, um, the nice thing is Windows Terminal has direct WSL integration, so you can literally just pick Podman machine default. It creates a distribution per Podman machine instance. So if I did it in another init, I could create another one. Um, and then um, so I, if I dive into this, I'm going to get a message that, that warns about the nested namespace. So systemd has to be started within a nested process namespace. So you need to enter it to access it from WSL. I've been debating on whether or not to do this automatically, um, because there are cases in which you do want to be in the root environment and not in the nested environment. Uh, but most of the time, you'd want to be in the nested one. So in this case, I'm just going to go ahead and do what it says, go into um, the nested environment, I could do the same thing. I can see the status is working. I can execute podman commands directly here as well if I wanted to. Um, let's say um, yeah, 8 micro date. And that'll reuse the, uh, the pulled image. Uh, so that's it. That's essentially uh, nothing super exciting, um, but it does show that we can have a really nice experience on Windows that's equivalent to um, what we have on Mac. And also, um, I, I'll do another video where I'll show the script-based approach. So this would be somebody who just wants to do just uh, WSL. I, I, again, I think the, the Pavian Machine init approach is the best one. Um, but we may, uh, it may be another uh, 
uh, mechanism that would be interesting to look at. Uh, so thanks everyone for your time. Um, hopefully uh, you found this useful. Um, feel free to send me any questions and I could always do another one of these or, you know, of course, uh, provide some additional technical details. I hope to have a patch sent over quickly. Um, I'm, it's really just polishing at this point. I need to add a, f a few additional commands like the, uh, you know, list and the um, file system usage and so on. But again, most of that stuff, uh, users not going to normally uh, care about. Uh, the, uh, additionally, the next step that needs to be added, of course, is it, what, what you won't see here is the um, the proxy capabilities to send. So if you're using Docker Compose, where it expects to use the Windows pipe um, or another Docker API client, I still need to add support for those uh, those capabilities. That will come in a, in a next iteration. It's not a lot of work. Um, I just needed to get the base implementation done first. Um, so once again, thanks.